Pardon me, I'm a little bit, uh, well, a little bit taken aback, I guess, with the way things uh, are go are go here. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Russell Klein. I am the preacher at the Madisonville Church of Christ, where I've been laboring for the last 20 years. I am pleased beyond words to be invited to come here and to speak to you today concerning this uh, most important subject of faith. My wife Tracy is here with me. I'm so glad that she could be with me today. Our son, uh, Kevin, is 20 years old. He's a student at the uh, Western Kentucky University. Uh, there was uh, some uh, troublemaker earlier that was giving me a little uh, bit of a hard time about that. Uh, I guess those Murray State folks can be a little uh, rascally. Up in Madisonville, we've really got a pretty good blend of Murray State, Western Kentucky, and University of Kentucky. In fact, we have kids right now that are enrolled in all three schools, and uh, you talk about Rivalry. You talk about uh, button heads. Yeah, they, they do that from time to time. But uh, it's kind of nice. My wife and I are originally from the state of Ohio, and uh, we, of course, cheer for the Ohio State Buckeyes. And uh, th- th- we, we've kind of reached a truce, I guess, with our brethren in Madisonville on that. Uh, they, uh, they said, yeah, Kentucky doesn't have much to cheer about during football season, so we'll let you cheer for the Buckeyes during football season. But during basketball, uh, we've got to watch out for those, Buckeye- for those uh, Wildcat fans. Now, uh, in, the, in the lesson this morning, we, we talked about what is faith. We talked about the biblical definition of faith as it is given in Hebrews 11. We, we emphasized verse 1, and we also emphasized verse 6. Hebrews 11, 1 tells tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And now I've been asked to talk about uh, faith that stands. And I guess uh, in thinking about this sermon, I I sort of of changed the title of it. And uh, I want to talk to you about faith that that stands when all else fails. Because, let's face it, there are a lot of things in the world around us that can't be counted on to last or to persevere. Human systems fail us with astonishing frequency. Uh, Things like government. Uh, Who is totally happy with the current government that we have in this country? Uh, National, state, local. There's always somebody that is unhappy with how things are are being run. Uh, You think about the justice system in this country. Right now, there's a huge segment of our population that is very unhappy with the justice system in this country and who feel that it is unfairly stacked against them. But to tell the truth, people have always felt that way. There's always been some segment of the population somewhere that feels that it's not being represented properly in the justice system. What about education? Back where I come from at the Madisonville Church of Christ, we have many teachers and school administrators that are part of our congregation. And, uh, well, let's face it, uh, they're just not always happy with uh, the way things are being run in the educational system in Kentucky and in other parts of the country. I think that's one of the reasons why so many more people are homeschooling their children is because of unhappiness with the educational system in the USA. What about health care? Health care is something that it seems like uh, everybody is dissatisfied with. Uh, I was one of those who for many years went without health insurance simply because my wife and I could not afford it. We have health insurance now, but the thing is, we don't know for how long because who knows how long it'll be before someone else comes up with another plan that is going to replace the one that is currently in place. It just seems like people are, are constantly being let down by systems that are run by human beings. And like the false gods of the ancient world, 
science and technology are revered in our society. People think, oh, science is going to figure a way out of whatever problems that we are facing. Technology will come along and will make life easier and will solve all the problems that we're facing in the world today. And indeed, there are many people for whom science and technology are the new religion of the age. And I think it's one of the reasons why unbelief, atheism, and agnosticism has been on the rise in this country for a long, long time. But you know what? Just like the false gods of ancient times, science and technology do not deserve our reverence. As Jesus put it in Matthew 4 and verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, real biblical faith, which has been our theme for the day, can stand up to any test that assails it. The Christian soldier's armor is described in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. And if you recall, you've got the breastplate of righteousness, you've got the girdle of truth, you've got feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You've got the helmet of salvation. There's the sword of the Spirit. And then there is the shield of faith. Uh, Faith is our shield that is supposed to protect us from the fiery darts, as the King James Version puts it, or literally flaming arrows that the devil launches at us every single day. If our faith is sufficiently strong, well, then it will stand. It will stand even when everything else fails. Strong biblical faith, as we said in the Bible class this morning, is based upon belief in the reality of God. Not just belief, but certainty of the reality of God. And also trust in the reliability of His promises. And if we have strong biblical faith, as it is described in Hebrews chapter 11, then it will not be diminished by things like the passing of time. And so that's why we say faith stands the test of time. Let's revisit Hebrews 11 verse 6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We talked about a certain duality in the definition of faith. We said that faith is belief that God is real, and it's also trust, trust that God will keep his promises to those who will obey him. That's why faith is that which motivates us and propels us to obey the Lord. Now, this is the kind of faith that saw Abraham through some difficult times in the half century in which he followed the Lord's lead. Again, we noted Hebrews 11:8 during the Bible study hour, which says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. For 50 years, Abraham followed the Lord's lead. The Lord commanded him to leave his family and all that was familiar to him, to leave a place where he felt that he was safe, and to go to a place that was unknown to him, to a place that he had never been before, a place where he did not know what might be lying in wait for him, but it was the place that God wanted him to go. So the Bible says that he obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. That's that's because of his faith. That's why Abraham today is considered one of the strongest examples of faith that you will find in all the Scriptures. Abraham was a man who was willing to take risks to do things that maybe a lot of people would not have been so willing to do, but he did those things because he trusted God. He knew that God was not going to lead him someplace that uh, was bad for him. He knew that God was not going to give him something that he did not need. He knew 
that God was looking out for him and what was best for him and for his family. So he followed the lead of the Lord. This is also the kind of faith that saw Abraham's wife Sarah through some difficult times in the quarter century in which she waited for the fulfillment of God's promise of a child. Consider Hebrews 11.11, 11, which says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. When Abraham was originally called to leave his father's house, his kindred and his country, and to go to a place that God would show him, God also promised Abraham that he would have an heir. Not only a child, but a male child, someone to carry on the family name, someone to carry on the family lineage, that through Abraham's descendants, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Well, Sarah understood the implications of that promise, and she understood that to mean that she and Abraham were going to have a child when in the first uh, half century of their lives, they had not had any children. The Bible says that Sarah was barren or infertile and was simply not capable of conceiving a child. She and Abraham had always wanted children but had been unable to have any. But now the Lord God comes along and promises them that they will have a child. They will have an heir. But that was a promise that the Lord was not going to fulfill right away. God in His own time would fulfill that promise of a child. And they had to wait for 25 years before Sarah finally conceived and brought forth their son Isaac. Now, this doesn't mean that Abraham and Sarah's faith was always so strong. There were some stumbling blocks along the way. There was, uh, for example, the time when Abraham told Sarah essentially to lie about who she was and say that she was Abraham's sister instead of his wife. She nearly ended up becoming the wife of the Pharaoh because of this misunderstanding in Egypt. And then there was the time when Sarah and Abraham tried to force God's hand in fulfilling the promise of an heir. And Sarah gave to Abraham her handmaid, Hagar, that he might have a child by her, and that that child might become the heir of Abraham's house. But the Lord made it very plain to them, in no uncertain terms, saying, that's not the child that I promised you. The child that I promised you is going to be born of both your seed. And so that's how it happened. There was a a miracle that was performed in the birth of Isaac. Not a a virgin birth like like the miracle that uh, resulted in the birth of Jesus Christ, but something that was certainly very miraculous, whereas Sarah, who had never been able to conceive a child before, was suddenly able to. And that, in her old age, when she was in her 90s, here she is having a child. Uh, Certainly, I think that this was something that the Lord did to emphasize and underscore the fact that this is a miracle. This is not something that is ordinary, something that is natural, something that happens every day. This is something miraculous, something extraordinary, something that is beyond the norm of human experience. And you know what? Through it all, through all the ups and downs, Abraham and Sarah still had faith in God. Sometimes their faith was weak. Sometimes their faith was stronger. But the thing is, the Bible holds it up as exemplary. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham did thus and so. Through faith, Sarah was able to do the things that she did, indicating that we would do well to emulate that kind of faith. I think that sometimes people look at Abraham and Sarah and people like that in the Old Testament and they think, those people were larger than life. Those people were, were superhuman. Well, no, they weren't. They were every bit as human as you and I are. They had their struggles. They had their ups and downs. The thing is that whenever their faith was weak, they had the presence of mind to strengthen their faith. They had the presence of mind not to allow weaknesses in their faith to cause them to stop following the Lord. They continued. And they persevered because of their faith in God. Faith stands the test of time. And that's important to us because we may have to live for a long time in a world that is full of sin and wickedness. 
you look at the world around you today, and you see so much darkness, so much evil, so much despair. I remember when I was a, a kid growing up in Steubenville, Ohio, uh, thinking about how tough things were. I remember when I went to uh, Steubenville High School. Uh, everybody called that place Big Red. And uh, it was such a scary intimidating place to me. I remember the first day of my freshman year vividly because I was just deathly afraid that if I happened to stray into the boys' restroom, something terrible would happen to me. Some senior would get a hold of me and uh, try to do something awful to me. And so for four years, I never went into the boys' restroom at Big Red. But, uh, but the idea was that even though I was so scared of that, I remember thinking years later when my son was born, well, what's it going to be like when he's in high school? What's it going to be like when, when he grows up and has kids and they go to high school? It just seems like things get tougher. It seems like things get more dangerous. And when you look at the world around us, it's a tough place. It's a dangerous place. It reminds me of a time at Madisonville when we had had a potluck dinner after Sunday morning services. One of our, one of our brethren there is a deputy, or at least he was at the time, he was a deputy sheriff for the Hopkins County Sheriff's Department, and he stopped by the building in his squad car and had his uniform on. He came to get something to eat, and I said to him, Scott, are the streets safe today? And he looked at me and said, I'm not going to lie to you, preacher, they're not. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe I should just go home and get back in bed or something. But uh, you know, even, in a, even in a small town like Madisonville, there are problems that, that we face. There are evils. There are temptations that we have to contend with. We have to make our faith strong so that it will sustain us in the years that lie ahead of us. Consider what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1, 5, and 6. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience. See, that's one of the keys to enduring and standing the test of time. You build upon your faith, and one of the things that you build upon your faith is patience. You know, the word patience actually comes from an old idea, the idea of one who is waiting for relief while enduring pain. That's why when you go to a doctor's office, a dentist's office, or something like that, you see patients in the waiting room, in some cases enduring pain while they are waiting for relief. No wonder we call them patients. Well, the idea of having patience as a Christian is the idea of being able to endure the temptations, the evil, the injustice of life in this world while waiting for the day when we will transcend all of that. Because the thing is, in heaven, there is nothing that is evil. There is nothing that is defiling. There is no temptation. In heaven, there is rest from our labor. In heaven, there is bliss. There is joy. There is peace. And that's worth waiting for, isn't it? That's worth enduring some hard times in order to get to. And the thing is, we don't know if we're going to live a long time in this world or if we're going to live for a short time in this world. But either way, our faith has to sustain us. We must be a people who rely upon faith, who build up our faith, because the world is constantly trying to knock your faith down. The world is constantly trying to get you to compromise, trying to get you to, to give in and do the easy thing instead of doing the right thing, if we will have faith, if we will have strong faith, then we will do the right thing in life, no matter what the cost may be. Faith not only stands the test of time, but it also stands the test of temptation. The building blocks of faith are also the best defense that we have against temptation to sin against God. Consider Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It's not just any old instruction that is going to build up your faith. If you study self-help books, if you study philosophy, if you study the wisdom of men, that's not going to build up your faith. You've got to study the Word of God. There is no substitute for that. And then also consider Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, 
that I might not sin against thee. What does it mean to take the Word of God and hide it in your heart? Well, I just gave you a little clue right there, didn't I? In the Bible, the word heart does not always refer to the blood pump in your chest. It refers to the gray matter between your ears. And the idea is that if I'm going to hide the Word of God in my heart, that means I have to read it, right? That means I have to study it. That means I have to learn it. I have to memorize it. That's how you hide the Word of God in your heart. And if you'll do that, what? Well, then you might not sin against Him. That's what's going to make your faith strong. That's what's going to build your faith up and enable you to endure any temptation to sin that comes your way. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, how did he respond? Well, each time he responded with the Word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written, is what the Lord said to the devil again and again in Matthew 4, 4, 4, 7, and 4, 10. And, well, there's no secret, folks. This is how we become strong against temptation, by learning the Word of God, by making application of it in our everyday lives. That's the only way to avoid, well, maybe not avoid temptation, but to confront temptation and to be successful against temptation. I've got to study my Bible. I've got to get to know the Word of God. I've got to allow the Word of God to influence me and direct me and guide me through life. When we are tempted by the devil, let us remember what is written in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is one of the most comforting passages that you will find anywhere in the New Testament. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape. Consider what that verse is saying. Now, I had a conversation about this not that long ago with my mother before she went into the hospital, and she was worried about some things that were going on in her life and in in the lives of her children. You see, I've got a really interesting family dynamic. Uh, I was raised an only child, but uh, after I left home, my mother and my stepfather became foster parents, and they ended up adopting five children. So I've got five brothers and sisters that are all basically the same age as my son, who is now 20 years old. And of course, I was a perfect child when I was at my mom and dad's house. I never gave them a day of trouble. But these five kids are a little bit of a different story. And my mother was calling me one day, talking to me about them, and and saying, well, you know, the Bible says the Lord won't put on you more than you can bear. I said, well, now, wait a minute. The Bible says that about temptation to sin. The Bible doesn't necessarily offer that promise when it comes to suffering, because the truth is, we all suffer, and sometimes we need help, don't we, to bear through that suffering. I'll talk to you about that, though, in just a minute. Right now, what we see is that when we are tempted to sin, we must not say, oh, this is worse than anybody else has ever faced. No, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Somebody else has faced that same temptation. Somebody else has overcome that same temptation. Because the truth is, no matter how much, no matter how much progress we might make in technology and in society and in all of these things that we hold so dear in our modern civilization, we still end up being tempted by the same old sins, don't we? We still end up being tempted by the same old problems, maybe in different ways maybe coming at us from different avenues, but it's still the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, just to name a few. So, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. What's that mean, God is faithful? That word faithful refers to the justice of God. It refers to the fact that God plays by the rules. God does not say, okay, there's one set of rules for you and another set of rules for you over here. No, God gives to us one law. He expects us to abide by it, and He abides by it as well. God is fair. He is just in His dealings with us. And He will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Now, sometimes people do say when they're tempted to sin, they say, oh, it's too much. I can't do it. I have to give in. Oh, the devil's just making me do this. No, the devil can't make you do anything 
against your will. The devil can't. He does not have that power. This verse assures us that God will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able. Rather, he will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. You see, the problem is that many of us have such a weak faith that we don't take the the escape route. Or we don't offer any resistance to the devil. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But in order to do that, you have to put up a fight. You can't just give in every time temptation comes to call. Faith stands the test of time, the test of temptation, and it also stands the test of tribulation. And I'm talking about the storms of life. I'm talking about the suffering that every human being has to endure. When the storms of this world assail us, it is our faith that keeps us from being moved away from God. Hebrews 6.19 says, "...which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil." Well, what we see there is that the hope of a home in heaven can keep our souls anchored to the Lord. But where where does that hope of a home in heaven come from? It comes from the faith that we have in God, because we have learned in God's Word about the evidence that can guide us through life in this world. You see, the storms of life come to all of us. Uh, Suffering is part of the human condition. Some people think, well, it seems like, you know, the, the rich folks, the famous folks, they don't have as much to worry about. They don't suffer the way that poor folks do. No, not necessarily. Riches is no guarantee of immunity from suffering. I learned that lesson on a day when I went to visit my grandma who uh, used to live up in Goshen, Indiana, up in the northern part of Indiana. And she was a lady who was not rich, not a millionaire by any means, but she knew a lot of rich people. She knew a lot of millionaires. And she said, she said to me, here, let me take you to the part of town where all the rich folk live. And she was showing me these big mansions, saying, oh, yes, that guy that lives there, he's, he's a well-known attorney. He's got uh, $10 million in the bank. He's got uh, law practices here in Elkhart and Fort Wayne. And, you know, he'd give all of that up if he could just get his son to talk to him. Uh, Or we'd go to another house and, well, this big mansion here, big pool in the backyard, that's a local doctor, a local heart surgeon. Oh, he's worth worth $20 million. And, oh, he's got all of the, he's got medical practices all over the area. But, you know, he'd give it all up if he could just get his wife to come back home to him. Every house... You had a successful person with millions of dollars in the bank, and you had a sad story to go with it. Uh, Riches is no guarantee that you're not going to suffer in this life. Just like like anything else, there's no guarantee that any of us will avoid suffering and will avoid tribulation. But if we have faith in God, we can endure. We can cope with the problems that we face. When Stephen was being persecuted, it was his faith in God that kept him on the path of righteousness. In Acts 7.55, he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he told the people what he saw. And what happened? Well, they stoned him to death. They threw stones at him until he was dead. Could you imagine such a thing happening to you? And yet, the Bible teaches us that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, we may not have people throwing stones at us until we're no longer able to move, but we do have people that try to insult us, that try to intimidate us, that try to get under our skin and cause us to compromise our faith. Don't you let that happen. Your faith can protect you from those things. Your faith can help you to to stand and to endure the test of tribulation. When our faith is put to the test, we must never stop trusting in God to do what is best for us and never forget the reward of faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Hebrews 11 recalls that time when God said to Abraham, Take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Offer him for a burnt offering unto me. 
The idea there is that God was putting Abraham to the test. And Abraham passed the test. He stood fast and firm. Now, Abraham did not have to make a burnt offering of his son, but he showed God that he was perfectly willing to. And the book of Hebrews indicates that Abraham thought within himself that God would would raise him from the dead if he had to, because he knew that God was not going to go back on his promise. God was going to keep his promise of a son, and that no matter what Abraham might have to do in the meantime, God would see to it that those promises were fulfilled. God promises to all who will obey him and who will be faithful to him a home in heaven. Well, he's not going to renege on that promise. He's not going to go back on that promise. And we have to remember that in order for us to have faith that stands, in order for us to have that shield of faith, which is our first line of defense against the weaponry of the devil, well... We have to resolve within our hearts that we're going to stand by the Lord and we're going to stick with Him no matter what. That shield, in order for it to be effective, we have to make it as big as we can. Remember we said before, faith, a little faith is powerful, but faith is not supposed to stay little. It's supposed to grow. It's supposed to be big. And if that shield of faith is going to protect us from the weaponry of the devil... It's got to be as big as we can possibly make it. So, as we come down to the conclusion of this sermon, I simply want to encourage you to let your faith today move you to obey the gospel plan of salvation. Have you studied the Bible? Do you know what it says about Jesus Christ, about the way of salvation that He has paved for all mankind? Do you know what it says about the church that He died to establish? If you do, I want to encourage you to let the faith that you have in your heart, that certainty of the reality of God, and that trust that you have built up in your mind of God and His promises, let that be the force that moves you to repent of your sins, to confess your faith in Christ, and to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins, as the Bible teaches, we all must do. And if you are a member of the Lord's church, but you have not lived a faithful life, I want to encourage you to come back and be restored to your rightful place in the Lord's church. Even if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, it can be enough to propel you to obey God and to change your life for the better. If that's the change you're looking for today, then please come as we stand and sing to encourage you.